Recent discoveries have uncovered dates, agendas, and goals that connect the Jesuits to a massive deception for the purpose of a multifaceted end-time delusion. The design of this deeply hidden plot has been to change the perception of the masses regarding the authority of the Bible, the correct shape of the earth, the layout of the universe, and the Creator's position in it. This change in perception has prepared minds for the overwhelming delusion to come upon the world under the first woe, the fifth trumpet, prophesied in Revelation chapter 9. This delusion will be a demonic attack under the pretext of an alien invasion. Reportedly, Vladimir Lenin observed, A lie told often enough becomes the truth. This quote is discovered within the belief of most. The Earth is a sphere. It spins through space while orbiting the Sun, hurtling thousands of kilometers an hour inside our Milky Way galaxy. So ingrained is this belief, if one speaks of the words flat Earth, listeners snicker. The mental reflect of a flat plane from which a person might fall into an infinite space creates this disrespect. A globe Earth, because unproven, is pseudoscience, yet believed worldwide and passed from generation to generation, and any who question it is mocked and ridiculed. For millennia, well-educated people believed the Earth was flat and placed at the center of the universe enclosed there with a protective covering. In the early 16th century, Nikolai Copernicus introduced a different model of the universe in which the Sun lay at the center and the Earth revolved around it. Copernicus' heliocentric model is taught today while the earlier geocentric model has been utterly rejected. Well, you know, it's like, um, I suppose it's like any theoretical science. Uh, we look up and we decide something. It's got to be that way. It's got to be. Uh, like, you know, the world being flat, for mm -hmm. instance. Right. It's got to be flat. Because mm -hmm. it's flat right here. That's exactly right. So We were wrong. A couple of years ago, I was asked to do a Bible study group. I'm thinking Catholics don't do Bible studies, you know. Mm -hmm. And to do a Bible study group in Houston. I mean, Catholics definitely don't do Bible studies in Texas. Mm -hmm. To do a Bible study group in Houston with a bunch of astronauts. Now, astronauts, oh, I could do that, yeah. So I wound up at a, at a dinner evening of about 12 couples, all of them astronauts or, and spouses. One of the guys, half of them were Catholic as it turns out, so so much for Catholics not doing Bible studies. One of the guys um, came up to me and said, you know, I just want to let you know, I believe in the absolute truth that creation was made in the six days just as described in the book of Genesis. And that's my religion. I just want to let you know that ahead of time. And I'm thinking, you know, have you actually read Genesis where it says the world is flat and it's covered with a dome and there's water above and below the dome? You know, where does the shuttle go? How come you don't get wet? But then he told me a little bit more. He said, you know, I'm, before he was an astronaut, he was a test pilot. Test pilots, you don't want to have the habit of creatively reinterpreting their written instructions. <laughs> Just another owner's manual. Because that's the way they view the world. Whereas in the ancient world, you know, what are the oldest books we have? The Iliad, the Odyssey, they're poems. They're books of poetry. And the world was interpreted in terms of metaphor and simile. And of course, the crazy thing is, science itself is metaphor and simile. Newton's equation for the fall of a rock due to the laws of gravity mm -hmm. is a poem. It says, the path of this falling rock is like the solution to this equation. What is gravity? You have no idea. Okay, next question. <laughs> wow. No, here's the difference. We can describe gravity. Okay. We can say what it does to other things. We can... We can measure it, predict with it. But when you start asking, like, what it is, I, I, I don't know. 
It's not that they're the same thing. In solution to this equation, it's not that they're the same thing. You know, the, the sad thing of that statement about evolution being proved, evolution is not going to be proved. Nothing in science is ever proved. So Nothing in science is ever proved. Science describes. It doesn't prove. I've got two really thick books on my shelf back in Casta Gandolfo. One of them is a Bible, and the other is a book by Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler called Gravitation. And this is you know, about that thick, and it's all about the Einstein's special or general theory of relativity. The Bible's 3,000 years old. The Gravitation book is 25 years old. The Gravitation book is out of date. It's mm. obsolete. Mm. Gravitation book is out of date. It's obsolete. Science books go obsolete. They're supposed to. You know, a thousand years from now, our science, our, our understanding of evolution, our understanding of the solar system, our understanding of the Big Bang is going to be completely different than what it is now. I hope. Are you saying, though, that then the problem is that um, on one level, science is dominated by these kind of fundamentalist techies who can't read a text other than in a fundamentalist way? Um, there is an element of that. I wouldn't say it's dominated by it. Yeah. Because the funny thing is most, most religious people are not, are not art creationist fundamentalists. Most evangelicals are not. Mm -hmm. But those are the ones you see on TV. You know, the, the sad thing of that statement about evolution being proved, evolution is not going to be proved. Mm -hmm. Nothing in science is ever proved. So I'm thinking, you know, have you actually read Genesis? Where it says the world is flat and it's covered with a dome and there's water above and below the dome, you know. Where does the shuttle go? How come you don't get wet? <laughs> Through your career and your writing and your acting, you've inspired so many people to enter the sciences. How do you balance science with science fiction? They're both the same. I've been discussing time and warping time and time space. Uh, with some famous scientists uh, doing something up in Canada which may sell, uh, uh, they may sell that show called The Truth Is In Our Stars and I've talked to um, Michio Kako and uh, David Suzuki and, and I'm going in a couple of weeks to talk to Stephen, Dr. Stephen Hawking. To see his expression when you see him for the first time. After a while, it's difficult to see his expression when you see him for the first time. After a while, you understand things, but at the beginning, you you have the impression that it's like a wall without any emotion. After a bit of time, you see that there's a lot of emotions and a lot of feelings. Stephen, when did you first realize you wanted to be a physicist? Oh. I think I knew from about the age of nine or ten that I wanted to be a scientist. Most of my activities, like playing with model fireworks, or model railways, or playing complicated games, was aimed in some way at finding out how the world worked around me. So, in a sense, you went from modeling planes to modeling the universe. I was never very good with my hands, so my models did not work very well. But I was always interested in models that I could control. And I think that nowadays, I have translated that into studying physics. Because, in a way, if you understand the universe, then you have control of it. And, and I tried to get uh, through his book, A Brief History of Time. It's not brief. <laughs> and it doesn't have much to do with history. And I, everybody I've met who uh, is uh, acquainted with the subject, I, I'm continually asking, <coughs> look, I hear space-time all the time. No, space-time. It's space-time. That without space, without time, it's time and space, and the space is the time. Hard to comprehend what it is. Well, I don't comprehend what it is, so I ask these very important people who are 
working in the field. One is space time. And they say, well, the gravitational force takes the, 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 the photon of a light and avenges the photon of the light. So without space, without time, you cut the time, it cuts. I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. In the 13, and I said this to uh, Dr. Cockham, uh, in 13.5 years, he says, no, 13.8 billion years. He corrected me by 0.3 billion years. <laughs> If, if that photon, I said to him, if that photon of light at that farthest galaxy takes 13.8 billion years to reach my eye, isn't that time? And he said, yes, but the space-time and the time and the space and the space and the time. <laughs> and I couldn't understand, I still, my opening sentence to everybody, including it will be to Dr. Hawking, what is space-time? And I can't, and I know 17 people just raised their hands. I'll tell you about space time. <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a concept that I just can't get through my head. Well, you can understand time, the passage of time. Are you going to explain to me what space time is? <laughs> yes. And you can understand the idea that uh, there's space, there's a distance between you and these 6,000 people. Wow. Uh, you said that with a measure of pride, too. <laughs> yeah. uh, Creation of uh, 6,000 people are in the office. But it takes a certain amount of time yes. for you to pass from here all the way over to the other side of the auditorium. Right, that's space. That is time going, that is uh, time going through space. You see, that's not what they mean at all. <laughs> that shows me that you have no idea. I mean, so the guy said, one of the gentlemen said, well, there are three dimensions, space, uh, 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 length, uh, width, right? And then you have the concept of time. As the so something dimension. happens within that space, you got time. That's the fourth dimension. Yeah. And I said, well, I, I, I get that. Something happens within a cube, and you, you have time, and then you have length and breadth and, and width. And, and I get the, what's the fifth dimension, I said? That's a, a fantastic band. A fantastic band. <laughs> That, that, that was my first thing. So I said, just give me another, because he said there's 11, then he said there's seven, 17, and then I heard lately there's 26 other uh, 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 spaces. Uh, uh, dimensions. Dimensions. Multiverses. So, so now, wait a minute. So I said, well, just give me one other dimension. I don't care about 16 or 17 or 26. What is the fifth dimension? What is the, give me another dimension. And the answer is, <clears throat> We can't conceive of that. You know, right. so, so, so that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Well, it doesn't mean it does exist. <laughs> you know, so I mean, how, how, so I said to Dr. Kaku, he, he said, uh, it, it's, it's in the, because he's working on string theory. You know about string theory. Yeah, and I find that in, in yeah, great music we too. Talk, but we're not talking about the stuff you wrap a package about. Adam. Yeah. It's vibration of some kind in a string. Okay? So I said, how, he said, it's like music. I said, well, I understand an orchestra with vibrating instruments. I got that. What do you play? What's your instrument? What do you do? When you get up in the morning, doctor, what, what do you do? And he says, it's all in my head. I think. I said, well, how do you prove what you're thinking exists? Because it's all theory. The theory of everything is what drives hundreds of physicists around the world. And it could be the crowning achievement of 2,000 years of our investigation into the nature of matter. We want an equation, one inch long, that will allow us to, quote, read the mind of God. We want an equation that will summarize everything we know about the universe. Gravity, light, the electromagnetic force, the nuclear force. We want all of it into a single equation, which will give us not just the Big Bang, the formation of planets and galaxies, but even the formation of people, maybe even love. All of it in a theory that eluded Einstein for the last 30 years of his life. And today, we think we have it. We do? Yeah. Why do we think that? Because we have a theory called string theory. It is fantastic. It is incredible. 
it has astounded the world of mathematics and physics and now you can't move in the physics world without bumping into somebody who wants to talk about the 10th dimension, the 11th dimension, the multiverse, hyperspace, time travel. All the things that were once considered science fiction are now centerpiece in our understanding of the nature of everything. You called it a theory, however. It's a theory because we are going to test it with the Large Hadron Collider. You know that Big Bang machine outside Geneva, Switzerland, that some people think is going to tear the world apart? Wrong. It's a machine of science. And we hope to create a mini Big Bang by slamming protons together near the speed of light, recreate a teeny weeny bit of genesis, and from that, extract information that will show us that perhaps string theory really is the theory of everything. And that's what I do for a living. That's my day job. What where did string theory come from and, and who's the founder of it? You're not going to believe this. In science, we always say that you make observations, you have a theory, you go make more observations, and it's a very, very tedious process. Wrong. Nobody that I know of in my field un, uh, uses the so-called scientific method. In our field, it's by the seat of your pants. It's leaps of logic. It's guesswork. Nobody that I know of in my field Un, uh, uses the so-called scientific method. In our field, it's by the seat of your pants. It's leaps of logic. It's guesswork. It's guesswork. He said, well, I've got this very elegant uh, uh, numbers equation. Equation, yeah. Very E, B, divided by the seven of four. <laughs> it's all in his head. How, how do you prove a black hole? How do you know those gravitational waves proved the collision of two black holes? Somehow, eventually, they are able to observe phenomena. No, they that can't observe. <laughs> it's too far away. It's too theoretical. How do we know what they're saying is true? It, you know what it really is? It's all science fiction. <laughs> so does that, does that make you a skeptic? No, well, science fiction says, if this is a story that I'm making up, and, and there's this thing called wormholes, and that's a science fiction concept. Although, these scientists says, say there are wormholes. How do you know? The, the mystery of science fiction is what I'm talking about. Science and science fiction are essentially the same. Are you still uh, through the wormhole? Yes, yes. I was watching it all day today. Now, what, is, what does that mean, wormhole? It's a scientific reference to something in the universe. They, someone came up with the idea. Not, we're never sure that a lot of the things that we imagine out in space are out there. But they think that there's probably something akin to a black hole. Right. That if you wander into it, you can wind up in another universe somewhere. Mm-hmm. Any, scary. Any, is there a proof of this? No, no proof, no proof of this. No. It's, it's just, it's just our, our best scientific hunch. Yeah. yeah, right. Now, speaking of something that's not a scientific hunch any longer, is the God particle. Yes. The, the Higgs, boson. Higgs, Higgs boson. What right. is that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> they say that it is the element or whatever that holds all of the matter in the universe together, keeps it from flying apart. Wow. Yeah. And it's, it's uh, uh, subatomic? Sub-subatomic. Sub-subatomic. Yeah. T tiny little particle. It's like, yeah. It, they say when you get into uh, quantum physics, mm -hmm. you get down that small, things don't happen until you look at it. So wait a minute. <laughs> It exists, but it will not happen until observed. Exactly. That, and is this that the, sounds strange? Yeah. Is this the thing they use the uh, linear accelerator to bust out the Higgs boson particle? Yeah, yeah. They keep going faster and faster with uh, sending protons around this 17-mile circle. Mm -hmm. It's in Geneva, the CERN. And um, they're coming up with all these different and, and, things. And does that thing, that thing travels the speed of light? No. Not quite the speed Not of light. Not quite the speed of light. Yeah. Just but, below it. But then, and the, uh, after how long do we see the Higgs boson particle? I, you never see it. 
You never do see it. You never see it. Oh, this is one of the situations son of a where, bitch. No. You never see it. No, you never see it. It's not like, whoops, there it is. Nope. Not at all. Um, uh, they, 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 they can see like a vapor trail type of thing. They can see the trail of it. Yeah. And, you know, there was a, a, they, they proved a, something about the, that matter uh, didn't travel as quickly as, as Einstein said it might travel, but it turned out that was a mistake. That, in fact, it does travel as fast as Einstein said it traveled. Well, you know, it's like, um, I suppose it's like any theoretical science. Uh, we look up and we decide something. So it's got to be that way. It's got to be. Uh, like, you know, the world being flat, for mm -hmm. instance. Right. It's got to be flat. Because mm -hmm. it's flat right here. That's exactly right. So We were wrong. Right. But it's, it's one of those things, if you let your mind begin to examine existence, you just go crazy. Yep. Copernicus' theory of a heliocentric universe was well known at the upper strata of the Catholic Church in his lifetime. While he preferred his theories published after his death, he ultimately agreed to publish his manuscripts on the persistent appeals of high church officials. Catholics were not first to reject Copernicus' views, for they themselves admit Opposition was first raised against the Copernican system by Protestant theologians for biblical reasons. The Catholic Church advanced Copernicus' heliocentric model, constantly urging him to spread it abroad, together with other theories that opposed the sacred scriptures. The necessity to change public conception from an accurate belief in a flat, enclosed earth to a false belief grew slowly. With sapient baby steps, the whole world would become amenable to the final delusion of an alien invasion under the first woe. The Catholic hierarchy had the perfect opportunity to lay groundwork for a global deception to culminate in this earth's final generation. This deception required a globe Earth spinning throughout the vast reaches of space, space inhabited by aliens and other sentient life forms. These contrivances created doubt in the Bible, putting science ahead of scripture, which advises mankind the Earth is enclosed and unmoving. They also place the Creator far away from His creation by presenting a universe unimaginably vast. To engineer this transformation in belief, the newly created Society of Jesus, commonly known as the Jesuits, became the agents of change. The Roman Catholic Church was waging war on the new Protestantism believers having come from their own system, while Copernicus was resisting appeals to publish his theory of a heliocentric solar system. Under the approval of Pope Paul III, the Jesuit order was established in 1540, and Copernicus dedicated his book, Revolutions of the Heavenly Bodies, to this very same Pope. This newly formed order, the perfect instrument to implement a clandestine operation for the Pope of Rome, began changing the public perception of the authority of the scriptures, the earth and the creator, through the Copernican Revolution. By deliberately teaching their followers to invite demonic spirits into their human spirits, the Jesuits exposed what manner of mankind each truly was. The Jesuit founder, Ignatius of Loyola, had taught all members of the Society of Jesus certain spiritual exercises which made them practical, mind-controlled slaves to Satan. They were to daily become as corpses or cadavers, that they unhesitatingly obey the will of their superiors. In opening the mind to the influence of demons, these Jesuits brought in a spirit of malevolence, a demonic intelligence that was unprecedented in Catholicism. Now, satanically controlled, 
the Jesuit priests became successful in every evil endeavor. They became infamous for their skill at deception and subterfuge, their ability to infiltrate governments and institutions of learning, their standing as advisors to kings and new leaders in education. The very influence they wielded was tantamount to becoming humanly insurmountable. Working through government entities and in the field of world education, they guide scientific research to further their own ends and present the biggest lie of all time, a globe Earth. Following Copernicus publications, it is probable the Jesuit order has produced more astronomers than any other demographic in Europe. That, ostensibly, a religious order should produce so many scientists should cause surprise. However, as these scientists have focused nearly exclusively in but one area, this gives us reason to question. Upon rejection of the sacred scriptures, which teach us Earth is a fixed, immovable object under a protective covering, a nefarious foundation was laid. Atop this were built perversions designed to force humanity to doubt the very word of our Father. With the biblical geocentric model rejected, a new explanation was required. A globe Earth its orbit of the Sun for millions of miles every year, illimitable realms of space with billions of galaxies, each composed of billions of stars with worlds innumerable. All this became necessary to explain the new heliocentric model of the universe, and mankind, over a short time, lost his divine significance. Thereafter was created an environment within which the writings of Charles Darwin found a receptive audience. Once science showed the Bible wrong, the disparager then diverged from her religious guise altogether. Anything suddenly became possible. There was nothing above question, including how the Earth seemed to appear in the vastness of space with all else and the existence of extraterrestrials. The Big Bang Theory is, today, the leading explanation about how the universe began. At its simplest, it talks about the universe as we know it, starting with a small singularity, then inflating over the next 13.8 billion years to the cosmos that we know today. Priest Andrew Pinsent holds advanced degrees in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, as well as a doctorate in particle physics from Oxford. In January 2015, he wrote, Being both a priest and a former particle physicist at CERN, I am often asked to give talks on faith and science. Quite often, young people ask me the following question. How can you be a priest and believe in the Big Bang? To which I am delighted to respond. We invented it. Or more precisely, priest Georges Lemaitre invented the theory that is today called the Big Bang and everyone should know about him. The author of the Big Bang Theory was none other than the Jesuit trained priest Georges Lemaitre. On October 28, 2014, Sarah Kerr reported. Speaking to members of the Pontifical Academy of Science, the Pope said it is possible to believe in both, insisting God was responsible for the Big Bang from which all life evolved. L'inizio del mondo non è opera del caos che deve a un altro la sua origine ma deriva direttamente da un principio supremo che crea per amore. Il Big Bang, che oggi si pone all'origine del mondo, non contraddice l'intervento creatore divino, ma lo esige. L'evoluzione nella natura non contrasta con la nozione di creazione, perché l'evoluzione 
presuppone la creazione degli esseri che si evolvono. Follow from cause to effect. 1. Without a globe Earth circling the Sun through the far reaches of space, we do not have the Big Bang. 2. Without the Big Bang, we do not have evolution. 3. Without evolution, we are more likely to accept creation as an act of intelligent design by a divine creator. The Roman Catholic Church does, in fact, accept evolution. Acceptance of evolution and its integral law of survival of the fittest gave rise to the bloodbaths of the 20th century in which millions lost their lives. Numerous researchers have established incontrovertible connections between the Vatican and the Nazi party. Regardless of the level of collaboration between the Vatican and the Nazis, what happened after World War II is even more significant. Operation Paperclip smuggled hundreds of Nazi scientists, including top SS officers on trial for war crimes, into the United States for use in America's Cold War space race. One of these Nazi party members, Werner von Braun, was promoted to head up NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Under Operation Paperclip, some 350 German scientists and former intelligence agents were given visas and well-paying jobs. Many of these scientists had questionable pasts. Braun himself had been an active member of the Nazi Party and his colleague at NASA, Dr. Hubertus Strugold, a specialist in aviation medicine had performed experiments on concentration camp inmates. The purpose of this massive and illegal undertaking appears to have been for the establishment of a worldwide authority on all things relating to space and astronomy. NASA became the public face of space. It has long acted as a front providing an unsuspecting world with pseudoscience legitimized by the backing of the U.S. government. NASA is its own monopoly. It controls the dissemination of public information on astronomy while hiding facts it does not want the public to know. While many countries and universities have observatories, Always it is the statements, photographs, and discoveries of NASA that make the news headlines. With NASA in charge of the flow of astronomical information to the public, it appears the Vatican has remained a central player in the truly accurate astronomy not being released to the public. For hundreds of years, the Vatican has owned more telescopes and observatories than any organization, private university, or government. NASA and the Vatican jointly own Lucifer, the world's largest binocular telescope. According to the official Vatican website, the Vatican Observatory is one of the oldest astronomical institutes in the world. And yet, where are the photographs? Where are the news releases of the latest discoveries? Precisely what have the Jesuit astronomers been doing for the last 500 years? Only they know. NASA's public release of information promoting the idea of an expanding, thus ever larger universe of incomprehensible size has led to the supposition there must be alien life on other planets. After all, if the Big Bang produced life on Earth, why couldn't intelligent life have evolved elsewhere? In combination with Hollywood and the science fiction genre, NASA has created an environment in which contact with extraterrestrial life forms is both fearful yet desirous. A recent book may hold the key to understanding the final steps in this long conspiracy to delude the final generation. 
Authors Tom Horn and Chris Putnam recently published a mind-boggling book in which they allege the Vatican actively seeks extraterrestrial life with their new Lucifer telescope. The book Exo Vaticana, Petrus Romanus, Project Lucifer and the Vatican's astonishing plan for the arrival of an alien savior asserts the Vatican is waiting for an extraterrestrial savior. In researching their book, Horn and Putnam were granted permission to visit the observatory on Mount Graham, which hosts the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope, VAT, in September 2012. Not only were they able to discuss the study of deep space with the Jesuit astronomers there, but they also gained access to one of the top Vatican astronomers in Rome. Horn said brother Guy Consolmagno, who has also been called the papal astronomer, told the authors some astounding information during five interviews. He says without apology that very soon the nations of the world are going to look to the aliens for their salvation, said Horn. Consul Magno also gave the authors private Vatican documents which reveal much of the thinking of high-level theologians and astronomers within the church. Horn said these documents show that they believe that we are soon to be visited by an alien savior from another world. These statements are not that shocking when the Vatican's ever-evolving stance on science and space is understood. On May 12, 2014, Pope Francis expressed a willingness to baptize extraterrestrials who indicated a desire for baptism. While the comment was clearly tongue-in-cheek, it made international headlines, this one crowing, Cool Pope is so cool that he is willing to baptize Martians. The net effect? It removed the idea from science fiction and transferred it to the realm of possibility. Talking about it as if it were possible gives rise to minds more accustomed to the construct. After the Vatican hosted a five-day conference on extraterrestrial life, Catholic priest Jonathan Morris appeared on U.S. Fox News to answer some questions. How would it change the church's teaching then? Well, you, if you consider yeah. for a moment, if you determine that there is extraterrestrial life there. Well, uh, one thing would be fascinating would be not only extraterrestrial life, but if it were extraterrestrial intelligent life forms. That would definitely make us go back and say, maybe our understanding of perennial truths needs to be updated. Now, the way we look at it is this. It's not about whether or not God was the creator, whether how, but rather how he created. It's not a question of whether original sin, this Adam and Eve story, is true or not, but our understanding of how that played out. So it's, in, it's growing in our understanding of perennial truth. Uh, I think that's an interesting explanation there. And I think also if it were determined, Father, that would be an earthquake, would it not? It would, be, it would be, and uh, especially um, if uh, the Vatican were <laughs> involved in accepting that. Questioning the cosmology of the earth often leads to people doubting scripture and its author and prepares the way for the overwhelming deception prophesied in Revelation chapter 9. Earlier it was stated, the Catholic hierarchy was presented with a perfect opportunity to lay the groundwork for a global deception to culminate in the final generation. The purpose for this intricate, multi-layered deception is to deceive the world's masses and create a desired outcome. To usher the world into a united one-world religion with the Pope reigning supreme, the devil will create a problem. This problem among Earth's citizenry will demand a solution. The solution will have a predetermined outcome. 
our wise Creator, has revealed this culmination of deception in Revelation 9. For 500 years, this Jesuit conspiracy has taught the story of a globe Earth, circumnavigating the Sun, itself spinning around the center of an immense galaxy which likewise speeds with over billions of galaxies throughout limitless space. Within this immense realm, surely there are other varieties of intelligent life which inhabit other worlds? These lies climax with the alien invasion prophesied in Revelation 9. The ultimate act will occur when Francis as Satan's representative, assumes leadership of the world while negotiating a peace treaty on behalf of the human race with the fallen angels. Then, Satan will have achieved his long-desired goal to rule the earth. The first wall reveals the opening sequence of events in Satan's endgame to deceive the world. For centuries, the Jesuits have worked to convince the human race the world is round. This Jesuit Pope unites mankind in infamy, all under one government and one religion, none of whom will ever know the beauty of eternal life. Pope Francis then stands before those left upon the earth as their prime benefactor. The truth is, an extraterrestrial invasion is not possible within an enclosed earth. None would fall for this delusion with scripturally clear and a spiritually correct understanding of the layout of our earth. People who know the truth would quickly realize any extraterrestrials appearing in our closed system must then be demons. And any attempt to place the Pope at the head of a unified one world religion would notoriously fail. The Pope would never be accepted as the savior of the human race in a brokered peace treaty with demons. The masses would see Francis colluding with fallen angels and turn from him with abhorrence. And yet, the first woe is just the beginning, just the opening salvo in this climax of the ages. It lays the foundation for an even greater fraud that will follow quickly thereafter. In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? What could be more alien to the universal aspirations of our peoples than war and the threat of war? The base itself becomes a target. Key targets would be the military anything that we could use later on to maybe try to fight back, these facilities would themselves be prime targets. We have underground bunkers, we have command centers inside of mountaintops. All of this would be essentially useless against an alien attack. One facility that has survived so far is the top secret Raven Rock Mountain Complex in Pennsylvania. Here, a man known as America's designated survivor now runs what's left to the most powerful nation in the world. This concept was designed back in the days of the Cold War for this very scenario of the senior leadership being taken out in one strike. The designated survivor is someone in the line of presidential succession, generally one of the president's cabinet members. 
each time the entire government gathers at events like the State of the Union Address. This person is taken away to a secure location like Raven Rock. So the hope would be that the designated survivor will carry on, will become acting president, and will be able to take those strategic decisions to maintain the continuity of government.